All right, we've got another uh, Chemistry 241 uh, answer key here in video format. Hopefully these are helpful to you guys as you study and move on uh, towards the first exam. So we're going to go ahead and dive right in. This one I think uh, was not one of the better quizzes I've seen. So I think a lot of you had some misunderstandings that need to be clarified. And this is a good opportunity to use this as a learning experience and build your skills, skills and build confidence. So let's go ahead and dive right in. This first one's really just a review problem, right? The idea here is that you've got a just a naming question, right? And so if we look at this, we say, okay, well, what's going on? Um, we've got a vanadium, we've got some ethylene diamine, and by now you really need to know what these ligands are. Uh, one of the first handouts we had, the first, one of the pages had all the ligands that you need to know right there. We've added a couple since, but those are the main ones. And so ethylene diamine, if you don't know ethylene diamine by now, you've got some reviewing to do, and it needs to be done now. So um, here's uh, glycinate, which becomes glycinato. Hydroxide becomes hydroxo. And then this is just a counterion, right? Because what's in the bracket tells you what's bound directly to the metal. And this is tetrafluoroborate, which is a very, very common counterion or anion. So that's a negative one, which means you know the complex, this thing in brackets, has a positive charge net because BF4 is a negative charge. And so we can go through, and you have to know these. So hydroxide uh, is a negative one charge. When it becomes a hydroxo ligand, we still count it as a negative one. Glycinate uh, is deprotonated amino acid, right? Glycine, so that becomes um, a negative one charge to become the, the glycinato ligand. And, uh, ethylene diamine, we should remember, uh, is neutral, and that's really important. So no charge there. So you don't even have to put the zero, but I'm going to put it there for illustration purposes. The most important thing, though, is you also need to know the charge in the metal. So if you look at this, we have one, two, um, two negatives. That means we've got to have at least three positives to make this whole thing a positive one. And I'm going to write a plus three on vanadium. So there you go. That's how you do that. Um, the other thing that's really important is count the number of coordination number sites. And so each ethylene diamine and each glycine, glycinato is going to be bidentate. That means they take up two bonding spots. And so one, two, three times two is six plus one more. So this equals coordination number seven. And this is the first time you've seen something kind of like this that's a weird number. I gave this to you on purpose because I wanted to see if you're actually thinking about the structures and not just blindly putting octahedrons because sometimes you know most of the time you're gonna see um, octahedrals or uh, square planers or uh, you know tetrahedral structures but every once in a while you're gonna have to deal with a curveball and this is one of them so we'll worry about the structure in a minute but for right now let's get the name down so the first thing we're gonna do is put the ligands in alphabetical order and if you you do not use prefixes when you put them in alphabetical order so you got ethylene diamine which is E obviously glycinato and hydroxo so E comes first now there are two of them and when you have a bidentate ligand you have to use the special prefixes and so many of you are just not taking the time to learn those rules so go back and look at the handout uh, if there are two of them and it's a bidentate ligand we call it bis that indicates two not by or die, it's bis. You have to know the right name. It's really important. And so here we're going to have, if I put my bidentates in parentheticals, if you don't put them in parentheticals, it's not the end of the world. I'm not going to take off points, but you do have to put bis. And let's see if my pen can be nice and precise here. Ethylene, diamine. Now, at this point, you should also take pride in spelling things correctly. I've seen all kinds of butchered ways. Every once in a while I make a typo and I admit I make mistakes, but you know, try hard to get the names right. So there's the one. And then what do we got? We got a G and an O, a H. So here we say hydroxo, so G, right? So that becomes, and that's also bidentate, but there's only one. If there's only one, you don't have to put a prefix. So it ends up being glycinato. Again, make sure you can spell this correctly. And then hydroxo. There you go. And then that's all the ligands, so check you got them all done. And now we just say, okay, we've got the metal. Is this a cation or a neutral? Yeah, it's cation, so we can just write the name as is. And vanadium is spelled like this, roughly, right? And so, and we put our oxidation state, and that's the complex. And now all we have to do now is put the counterion. So I'll just put tetra 
don't forget there's a U in fluoro and that's a borate not a bromate some of you got B and BR confused so you gotta I mean if you haven't figured it out by now science is kind of uh, kind of uh, specific in many cases and a boron and a bromine are quite different so you gotta remember which one's which okay so there you go so the full name is bis ethylene diamine glycinato hydroxo vanadium 3 tetrafluoroborate I know it's a mouthful but you know sometimes you just gotta deal alright so here we go this next one we're gonna draw it and so what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna put the metal because that's the most important thing, right? And whenever I draw the metal, I always right away like to go ahead and put the oxidation state, and I knew that from up above. And you look at this, and we said this has coordination number equals seven. So I have to form seven bonds, and this is gonna be kind of weird, so I cut you a little slack here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just draw a tetrahedron and cap it. So I'm gonna draw my four in the plane of the paper. I'll draw one out behind the paper and one in front of the paper and then you can stick the other one on somewhere now usually it'll be capped what cap means is one of the faces of the octahedron just you insert the ligand in there so I'll just put it behind the paper no big deal but the most important thing is there are seven spaces if you drew six you weren't really paying attention so you lost a few points um, let's go ahead and just put these around I think probably the easiest one to do is to put the um, hydroxo and the hydroxo is going to bind through the oxygen right not never through the hydrogen so you need to show me what is bound so draw that line connected to what's actually contains the lone pair um, next I'm gonna draw oh I don't know I like the ethylene diamine so I'm gonna go ahead and throw them on there first and I'm gonna put these like that now a neat note about ethylene diamine right um, there's two there sorry um, ethylene diamines kind of a small ligand so ethylene diamine can never bridge 180 degrees it's always going to be kind of in a I don't want to call it cis but it's always going to bond 90 degrees with respect to itself and so I'll put my CH2 show me the bridge that's really important CH2 and connect it so that's ethylene diamine that's what I mean when I say don't use abbreviations if you just wrote EN or GLY that's that's points off that means you don't understand what the what's really going on and that's really important and so let's go ahead and put another one over here. So we, again, we draw the nitrogen connecting directly because that has the lone pair. And then the hydrogens can just attach over here. I'm gonna draw my CH2, I'm gonna draw my CH2, and then connect it to the nitrogen. There are my two ethylene diamines. There's my bis ethylene diamine. And then finally, let's go ahead and, if you don't remember the structure for uh, glycinato, it's, it's on the page with ethylene diamine and oxalato, so you gotta you know go back and review. Uh, really important, and so it's gonna have one oxygen and one nitrogen, and so we're gonna put that there, and it's bound to a carbon, right? So we put the carbon there, that's bound through an oxygen double bond, and then finally another carbon there, and then to give carbon its four bonds, we'll do that. So roughly speaking, that would be full credit. I know it's not perfect. Coordination number seven is kind of different, but you know what? You're here to be challenged and to learn new things, and so I hope this uh, pushed you to kind of recall things that were going on. Again, you know, you gotta, in order to do challenging problems, you gotta be able to do basic problems, and, and really the idea is to, you know, push you a little bit on quizzes and homework so you do really well in those exams. All right, um, and then don't forget, overall, this thing has a plus, plus ch one charge, and I'm just gonna write my counter ion on here like that to show it's, it's just there. It balances out the charge, but it is in no way bound to the metal. That's why it's called a counter ion. So hopefully you got that. All right, let's go ahead and move on to these next two. They really, if you think about it, these are really just vocabulary quiz type things. If you don't know what the language of chemistry, you don't it's like translation you'll never get the problem right if you don't understand what people are asking or if you're in lab and you're trying to describe something you don't have the right words for it you're gonna really feel like you're out of the loop and so we gotta be able to do this right and so if you look at this one in this case I'm really again gonna focus on the complex right the thing that's bound directly to the the metal and so here I've got uh, NO2 and I've got two of them and I've got chloro and I got four of those so right then you know these are both monodentate ligands so that's gonna be coordination number six which is yeah that's gonna be an octahedron that's pretty easy now what does constitutional mean well that means essentially we're gonna talk about different structures another term would be structural isomers right and so we're gonna talk about how things are connected different structures the connectivity the skeleton is different right and if you look here you see that if we look at nitro 
which is this ligand's name when it's bound through the lone pair on the nitrogen, is ambidentate, right? Because it can bind either through the oxygen or the nitrogen. There are lone pairs everywhere. Now, there's a resonance structure to be drawn here, and I'll challenge you to do that on your own, but typically you're going to have a lone pair on the oxygen and a lone pair on the nitrogen. When it's bound through the, the nitrogen, we call it nitro. When it's bound through the oxygen, we call it nitrito. We talked about this in class. This is a new ligand uh, that was added after the first couple of lectures. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and draw uh, my cobalt, and right away I'm going to add my oxidation state, but ooh, I better go back and figure it out. So nitro, this is nitrite, right, and it becomes nitro. These are all negative charges, so negative one, so four, plus two more, six times negative one is negative six. If this whole thing is uh, negative four to balance the ammoniums, that means that this is going to be, I believe, a cobalt two. So I'm going to go ahead and write my little cobalt two there. I'm going to go ahead and write my cobalt two here, and now I'm good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and draw my octahedron. I'm going to put one behind the paper, one in front of the paper, and there we go. So now I just put in my ligands. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bind this one like that. I'll put the little negative charge. Or if you want to, you can show me like that to show that it's actually bound through the nitrogen. Do not, you know, you got to show me somehow that you understand what's connected. That's really important. And then the other four spots are just the chloros. They just take up the rest of the room. And then finally, you know, there we go. We put that over there and we say, okay, this whole thing has to be a 4 minus um, because that's how it works here. And then we can say, okay, the counterions are going to be 4 times um, the ammonium. And there we go. Now, you might notice there's cis. these are oriented in cis. You could have drawn them in trans. It doesn't matter. I didn't specify. And we're talking about constitutional isomers, not stereoisomers. So it doesn't matter where we put them, but the connectivity, the structure matters. And so all I'm going to do now is draw the exact same thing, but the only change I am going to make is how this ambidentate ligand is changed. I'm going to change the actual connectivity, the structure, the constitution, if you will. And so I'm going to now say, instead of attaching through the nitrogen, I'm going to attach through the oxygen. And you can do something kind of like that. And you know, if you wanted to, you could do this, right, to show me what's actually connected. Both of those are perfectly fine. And then I'm going to just draw, you know, the four chloros. I'm going to put my little brackets there, and that's the same negative four charge. Now you had a couple of options here. Did you have to change both of them? No, you could have changed one, and technically that's still a constitutional isomer. It doesn't really matter. But what we're talking about here is a different connectivity the different structure, the different bonding arrangement. Really important, the connectivity points are what we talk about when we talk about the constitutional aspect of the isomerization. So there we go, and let's not forget the counterions just for full credit. There we go, pretty easy. So we'll go to this next one. This next one, again, you've got uh, oxalate here, and this is a bidentate ligand with two minus, so that's gonna be a four minus. Uh, thiocyanate or isothiocyanate. We don't know which one's connected. Uh, it's not specified. Usually I'll underline to tell you which one, but if I underlined it, I'd give you the answer essentially. So I didn't do that. I left you some freedom. If I don't tell you what's connected, you can choose, right? You can, you can understand which both of these have lone pairs. And if you don't believe me, draw the Lewis structure and prove it to yourself. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, negative six. And we know this whole thing is a two minus, right? Because it has to be balanced by the two potassium counter ions and so here we say okay that means that the platinum must be looks to me like it must be a positive four that balances positive four negative six negative two looks good to me um, two uh, binding sites for each bidentate oxalato ligand and again if you don't know what oxalato we've been dealing with it in lab for three weeks now so shame on you um, you know go back and review the notes in your lab because oxalate something we've used for since the first week of class, so go back and look at that. Um, and then these guys are monodentate, but they're ambidentate because they combine either through the sulfur or the nitrogen, but you know what? It doesn't matter because this is not a constitutional isomer. We're only looking at stereoisomers. And in this case, stereoisomers deal with the 3D arrangement of the ligands around. They have the same bonding. It's just that we put them in different positions, and I'll try to explain that. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw my platinum on there, and I'm gonna go ahead and label the charge. I'm going to draw my four 
in the plane. I'm going to draw one behind and one in front. That's just how I like to draw the octahedron. And now let's go ahead and just throw on the, uh, I'm going to put them through the sulfur. I'm going to go S, C, N, and I'm going to say S, C, N, and I'm going to show that that's bound directly to the sulfur. Right, it could have been bound through the nitrogen, but I chose not to. Uh, you could have put it through the nitrogen, whatever your favorite bonding motif is, you can do whatever you like. And then I need to go ahead and bond my oxalate, right? And the oxalate is really important. You've got to be able to draw structures. That's what chemistry is all about. So it's C2O4, and that's really important. And so I'm going to draw the other one here. And then here's my carbon, carbon, oxygen. Remember, carbon needs four bonds. That's really important. That looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and put my brackets around because I know this thing has to be an overall 2 minus and then 2 times potassium plus. Now here's a real pet peeve of mine. I, I hate, hate, hate when I see people do that because that looks like you've invented some kind of diatomic potassium. Don't write that. The ion is potassium plus and you have two of them. So write two times. Don't make up things that look like they're bound together. We don't use subscripts to tell how many of these things are around. We use subscripts when we're talking about formulas, right? If you want to tell me how many there are, go ahead and write two times what it actually is. Don't start making up science fiction weirdness. If you, you know, start doing like stuff like this and you're making dilithium crystals like it's Star Trek or some garbage, so don't do that. Okay, I digress. So in this case, we're talking about stereoisomers. And here we had these two, I chose to bind them to the sulfur. They're 90 degrees apart. We would call that what? We call that cis. And so the opposite of cis is trans. And I can go ahead and draw these again. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to keep the binding the same. So I'm still going to bind through the sulfur. I'm just going to change them from 90 to 180. And that's really quite easy to do. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the same skeleton here, if you will. And I'm going to go, there's S, C, N, bound through the sulfur, obviously. Don't draw it to the carbon. Carbon has no lone pairs. You draw the line to the carbon, it shows you don't know what in the world's going on. Um, and then here I'm going to say not here because that would be 90. I need something 180, so I'm going to draw it down here at the bottom. Really important. And then the oxalates, I've basically just moved around. And there we go. And I'm going to put that there, that there. And I'm going to put oxygen here, oxygen here because it's bound through the oxygen. There we go. I've got to put that double bond there, that double bond there. That looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and put a 2 minus there, and then finally, like I said, potassium plus times 2. If you want to draw two of them, knock yourself out. You can draw two of them. It doesn't matter to me. But that's what you got to do. And this would be, of course, the trans because they're 180 degrees, whereas the cis is 90 degree orientation. So stereoisomers deal with the location about the metal. In this case, we had 180 versus 90, but notice that we did not change the connectivity. We didn't change the structure. We didn't change the constitution of the way it's bound. So we, we just move them in terms of where they are located in respect to each other, but they're still bound through the same thing. Really important. Don't change both at the same time. It shows me you don't understand what's actually going on, and I know you can do that pretty easily if you just kind of keep your vocabulary straight. All right, last one. Shouldn't take too long and we'll be done with this homework. Okay, so this one was a little tough for some of you. Remember, the first thing you wanna do when you're looking at a structure is again, look at the ligands and look at the metal. So this is iridium. And if you go down to the periodic table, you can, that was provided, look at that. There's a periodic table and you can find iridium. And iridium is what? 3D, 4D, that's a 5D metal. It has nine valence electrons. And in this case, if you look up above, Iridium was a 3 plus, and I'll prove it to you. If you look over here, this whole thing has a 3 minus charge. The cyanoligand is negative because it comes from cyanide, negative 6. If the overall is a negative 3, that iridium has to be a 3 plus. And there you go. So if you come down here, real easy way to do it is you look at the numbers, they tell you how many valence electrons for the most part, um, you know, and you say there's 9 valence electrons minus 3. That ends up being three, four, five, that's gonna be five D, because the S electrons are removed first, right? So we get rid of that electron, that electron, and you get rid of one of the D electrons. Remember the order, so that's gonna be five uh, D, um, that's nine minus three, if I can count today, it's six. So there you go. So we gotta deal with six electrons. Easy enough. 
And given that there are six, right, there's coordination number equals six, so that's an octahedron. Uh, we could draw that like we did up above, but most importantly here you need to know the crystal field splitting diagram. And so I'm gonna go ahead and draw uh, my five orbitals, and for the octahedral field, we have to label them as such, xy, xz, yz. These are on the bottom for the reasons we discussed in class. The dz squared and the x squared minus y squared are up top for reasons that we talked about. So we label the d orbitals, and if you want to get specific, right, these are all what? These are all 5d orbitals, part of that 5d subshell. Not, not super important, but you need to know the names. And then let's label the delta. So we need to label the delta is the gap between the splitting. And we call that delta O because, or delta oct, because it came from the octahedral geometry that caused the splitting. And we need the number of electrons. So let's go. We've got six. One, so I'm going to go ahead and write that down. Six electrons. 5d6. One, two, three, uh oh. Do I go up or do I stay down? Well, you have to know how big this gap is. And we talked about in class, there are two things you do. If it's a 3D, that is the first row of the D, D block, you have to decide based on the ligands. However, if you go to 4D or 5D, almost always, for reasons we talked about in class, that gap is going to be big. So for 4D and 5D, delta O is big. So in that case, if delta O is really big, we don't want to jump that. That's too much energy. We'll stay down here and pair up electrons. Sure, we take a little hit because pairing electrons is destabilizing, but it's not nearly the energy penalty by jumping that huge gap. So we're going to go five, 4, 5, and 6, and we're done. Now again, 3Ds, you have to look at the ligands, right? So 3Ds, you have to look at the ligands to figure out the size of is del O small or large, and we talked about that in class too. Now we say, is this paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Well, every single electron, all uh, three orbitals down here have paired. There are no unpaired electrons, so we call that diamagnetic. And then finally, if we know this is a big gap, what color of light, low energy or high energy is being absorbed? Well, if it's a big gap, we just talked about being a big gap, that's going to be a big energy color. What are your big energy colors? Well, violet, uh, blue, you know, maybe even green, I'll, I'll go that far, but no, no weaker, right? And so the opposites of these would be perfectly fine. And you could have said for violet, it would be yellow, right? For blue, it would be orange. And for green, it would be red. So any of these low energy colors are what's left after these high energy colors are absorbed. And you could pick one. I don't care which one you pick, but pick one and stick with it because that's a big gap. So light's being absorbed. So if you take that light out of the Roy Biv spectrum, you're going to be richer in the color that's opposite in the color wheel. So you could have picked any of these, but that's about the only thing I would have accepted. Any of the other uh, colors shown that, that you just didn't understand what in the world's going on. So I know this quiz was kind of tough for some of you. I hope this has cleared up uh, a little bit of confusion. If you have more questions, come talk to us, but um, you got to know this stuff because we got an exam coming up. So take exam advantage of the QSC, take advantage of office hours and you know open door policy for um, when we're around Hayes Hall. But the other thing is we'll have some review sessions in the evening, so make sure you take advantage of that. You gotta really want to do well, and I know you can. It's just you gotta put the time in and, and work efficiently. You know, if you're spending hours and hours and you still don't get it, you're not being efficient. Come talk to us, go to the QSC, use the resources that are available, and your life will be a lot less stressful. All right, catch you next time.